We're glad to know you're still there. And uh, it's time now to go to the press and see what made it to the front pages of our national dailies. Some of the national dailies we have today are Punch, The Guardian, and The Nation. And we're going to be, we'll, we'll try to be as snappy as possible on these headlines. And today we have Professor Kamilu joining us uh, to discuss some of these headlines. Good morning and welcome to the program, Professor. Good morning, thank you. Okay, there are screaming headlines here um, on the front pages of newspapers. Chief among them is that we have a ministerial list. Now all of them have portfolios. And would just like you to uh, talk about uh, the, the portfolios that uh, have been assigned to the various ministers. Let's begin with that. Okay. Yeah, you see uh, the portfolios so far given. I think uh, some of them are clearly going to be productive, but uh, some are not likely to bring any change from what we have seen before. Now, let's take, for example, the Petroleum uh, Ministry, which from all indication, the head of state is also going to be the Minister of Petroleum. So I think that one... Uh, is not likely to change much because given the overwhelming work uh, for the head of state, I think, I think that ministry will not change anything like the way we saw it um, uh, in the previous uh, administration. And then the other one like uh, FCT, I think we are likely to see, uh, you know, a kind of rambunctious um, uh, minister, minister I give him his pedigree, the way he handled, you know, uh, the state and the way he handled the Ministry of Education when he's, he was junior minister. So I think there is likely going to be that, especially given his top position uh, on the opposition party. So I, I think uh, these are some of the things. And then if you take, like, uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, the person may not have a background uh, in defense, but um, uh, he was given uh, that ministry, and given the centrality of uh, that ministry, uh, one hopes that uh, perhaps the ministry, the minister should have been, uh, you know, a person who is well groomed in the issue of defense. But since that is what it is, so I think generally, uh, if you look at it, it is more a political consideration in terms of uh, the assignment of portfolio, uh, not much um, uh, on, uh, you know, competence and other things. But I'm not discarding, I mean, discrediting a anybody, but I think in some ministries, this is what is likely going to hamper their performance. Okay, well, at least we know that the Minister for Finance is a... Uh uh, is somebody who has been there before and uh, he's been with the, the president when he was governor, Wale Dun, I'm talking about him. But we expected that at this time, uh, when we know that we have a competent person in finance, we have a competent person that in defense, another competent person in education, so that we don't have the case of after four years or eight years, somebody coming to confess that I had no idea uh, about the ministry that I headed. Uh, we, we were expecting that we will have this kind of persons that will not go and learn on the job. Are you saying you're comfortable and you're giving them a timeline that maybe they will use this time to learn and they can still perform well. Are you confident in that, with that? Yeah, I am confident, uh, provided the uh, head of state um, decide to uh, kind of periodically change, uh, check the performance. Because allowing somebody like what we had in the previous government, somebody will run, whether he or she performs well, will run for eight years in a ministry, you know, that one will not uh, augur well for uh, the performance. But if you put people, and uh, maybe after a year or two, you see something that is needed for a then you can reshuffle. In that way, you can inject new blood into the 
system and you can put a kind of checks and balances whereby people will be up and doing because if they know that uh, their performance is what will determine their stay in office i think that will uh, do it after all if the, the ministers surround themselves with experts there is every likelihood that uh, they will perform so they should open have an open door policy where they will ask, uh, assess um, uh, experienced people and utilize the input uh, in order to work uh, for the country. Okay. Uh, don't you think, don't, are you not worried that um, the trend that was set by the last administration, the, the last president, uh, former president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, to become the uh, minister for petroleum is, is not really good for our country or you are comfortable with that as well? No, I am not comfortable. In, in part, that was what I first said, that one of our problems is, you know, we overload, uh, uh, you know, the people. Uh, you see, the president has much, too much in his hand. He is uh, the head of government. He is the head of state. He is the commander-in-chief. He is whatever you give you a lot of him by the constitution. Now, if you now add ministry of uh, and, and, and a ministry to him, I think that ministry is going to suffer, as we have seen before. And this is one of the mentality of uh, African leaders. We tend to, the leaders tend to have a kind of fathery feeling that uh, they are like fathers, everybody is their child, therefore they know everything, and at the end of it, you, you see, you don't see any change. Okay, so I don't think um, by taking the Ministry of Petroleum, uh, we are going to see any change, especially given the fact that uh, uh, now we have virtually, if we can call it a crisis in that area. So I think uh, there, there, there should have been, there is a need for the head of state to delegate that ministry to a very competent person uh, so that he can, uh, you know, uh, be able to steer it. But the way he put it, I think um, things will not change. Mm. Okay, uh, let me take yet another headline from the punch. Federal government tackles forex crisis with three billion dollar loan, and Atiku knocks Tinubu. That headline is there at the top left corner of uh, the front page of the punch newspaper. So they are taking a three billion dollar loan to tackle uh, forex crisis. What are your thoughts on that? One, I think I, the issue of loan is one of the problem. Well, one thing that plunge at in, into the problems we are having now. And secondly, so long as you deregulate the market, uh, even if you borrow the money, it will end up, you know, in the hands of very few. Uh, but uh, the system will not uh, improve. Okay, so putting that uh, amount of money, I think will just we will be dancing in the in the same place. It may not likely change anything except perhaps that, that uh, it will overburden us with a uh, by burden a uh, burden of debt, and then what you pump into it. Since you say you are not going to you know regulate the currency, then the it will end up in the pocket of very few people. Okay. Um, in the Guardian newspaper, there's another worrisome headline, uh, the, the one that is boldest of all, is saying resurgence of killings threaten not central states and food production. There are so many bodies, uh, world bodies, that are talking about the possibility of us suffering uh, food scarcity, the food insecurity as it is. And now, we are having farmers not able to go to the to the farms and so many other things militating against the production of food now what what does this portend to us as a nation the resurgence of killing now we're talking about even going to niger as well to fight talk to us yes you see it will compound our problem no central is literally the bread basket of nigeria and uh, if there is high insecurity, you know, the, the food production will go down, uh, especially in this time when, uh, you know, 
scarcity and uh, inflation uh, in this sector is um, is a very serious uh, problem. So added to that insecurity, I think we are going to have a food insecurity, and that will compound the, the problem that we are having, which I think the government needs to uh, you know, and decisively. Otherwise, we are going to have a very, very serious problem if uh, given the situation we are now, and then there is also a additional thing in terms of food uh, uh, insecurity. Okay. Um, Nigeria needs sustainable solution to resident doctor strike. Uh, that is uh, the editorial on the Guardian newspaper. Uh, every day we hear about strikes. Uh, sometimes they strike uh, because of insecurity, because we've seen cases where they go on strike because one of them has been uh, kidnapped by bandits because that is a security issue. They go on strike. We've heard them go on strike because of the emoluments, because of the allowances, because of uh, the conditions of service that they are facing in Nigeria. Do you think we can arrive at a solution? And in your own opinion, what can be the solution to these incessant strikes by not even, let me not even limit it to doctors, but by workers in Nigeria, because everybody seems to be living, especially the professionals like uh, do doctors in this case. Yes, you see, yes, um, it is possible uh, and feasible that we can arrest uh, this, uh, to use our word, incessant uh, strike. Uh, what the government needs to do is to create a conducive environment for workers to, you know, exist. Uh, a situation whereby you see, one, there is that high level of insecurity. And uh, we just finished with that of food uh, protection. Uh, so if the government doesn't take care of that, uh, it will affect virtually all the se or every sector of uh, the Nigerian economy. And secondly, uh, when you are talking of emolument and uh, other things, you see, when you create two worlds in Nigeria, uh, the world of, let's say, the politicians and the world of the rest of us, where you see uh, the government will be uh, complaining that there is no money to pay workers and other things, but you at the same time see how uh, politicians, you know, squander uh, the national resources. So you create that uh, dichotomy, and uh, that is why people will keep on demanding for their rights. And the other thing is, when I say conducive environment, is that um, you make living uh, easy, uh, affordable to people. Uh, no matter what you get, when there is high inflation, there is this thing, you, it, it will not, uh, you know, meet the demands of the workers. After all, they, they see competitive uh, uh, this in, in other places, whereby a resident doctor here in Nigeria, or like us in, in Asu, you know, where you, you work, uh, literally, uh, you sweat yourself to death, and yet you see you are fellow uh, people in other places you know, making it. So there is this tendency to compare uh, Nigeria with other things. There's also the tendency for people to, you know, be running to greener posture. And all these things so depends on how the government tackle the issue. But how do you think the government should tackle this issue? That is what I'm saying, that they should create a very conducive uh, uh, environment. One, you know, this issue of uh, emolument, make it affordable. I'm not saying you increase salary to this, thing, but look at uh, the issue of like inflation. When you arrest it, I think even if you give uh, workers meager amount, if they can and live comfortably uh, within their own minimum wage, I think that uh, is easy. Uh, the second thing is you create also the conducive environment. I, I address this issue of insecurity and other things which will hamper performance uh, or threaten performance in, in, in by workers, okay? And the, the other thing is now uh, you, you have a, a very uh, affordable wage system and uh, lastly, not the least, uh, is that 
when you raise the the, the dignity and humanity, I mean, of labor. But when you make it in such a way that uh, it is like a slavery, uh, I think that is when you create uh, uh, this kind of uh, tension between the labor and the, the employers. Okay, we've talked extensively about security, and another worrisome thing is security on our waterways. We just heard a story about a rig that collapsed, and some people were missing. One life, at least, was lost in that uh, accident. Uh, but now we are hearing from Nimasa that the capsized oil rig operating was operating illegally on Nigerian waters since 2016. That is nearly 10 years, just it's seven years already that it's been operating since 2016 on our waters. It's been operating illegally. And one would just ask, what were the security agencies doing? What was NIMASA doing? What was the Navy doing? What were, every, what were the people that were responsible uh, to arrest them or to make sure that they are not on our waters doing that? It stayed there until this incident of collapse is the one that has brought it to our our knowledge. What do you? How do you, you describe see, this kind of a situation? Yeah, this is quite unfortunate. If uh, uh, such illegalities are going for many years and nobody is uh, punished, uh, then you are likely. To to go and have this kind of uh, situation. So this shows the level of corruption, that this shows the level of uh, insecurity that we have. Uh, to now, if not because uh, it has capsided, maybe it will be for another 10 years or 20 years ahead and nothing will happen. So I think unless we take uh, the stand measures and uh, not only delegate responsibilities, but also make people accountable for their own action. Like now that we have seen it, even if it is over this thing, you can go back, look at who are the people involved there, and they charge them, investigate, and find out who are culpable, and then you punish them. By the time you take that measures, you are going to have a preventive uh, a solution to a similar occurrence, because one of the basic uh, things of a law uh, is one to restore uh, you know this i mean three basic things of the law one is to restore uh, what has been damaged restitution then secondly to punish people uh, who are guilty of the offense and thirdly to deter others from doing it and you cannot deter People, if, uh, you know, those who are guilty are left scotch free Though in some cases they are even rewarded for their own uh, problem. Because if you allow somebody, you know, to uh, embezzle money through, you know, that kind of thing, and now you don't do anything to see it, maybe perhaps the next time you give him political appointment and other things. So you are encouraging these things to happen. So I think uh, the problem is Deep, it is deep rooted in the issue of corruption in Nigeria, and that is why we are going to have this. So I think the best thing for the government to do is not allow this to go, to investigate it and find out who are capable, capable in it, and then punish them accordingly. Okay, um, let's take like two headlines before we wrap it up. Uh, we've seen in the Nation newspaper and other newspapers also about uh, the fact that some chieftains of the PDP are complaining that the opposition party right now, PDP, uh, may co become extinct, especially with the kind of uh, game that the, the party in power is playing. For instance, now we have a minister for the Federal Capital Territory who is a PDP member, as, as we speak now, he's still a PDP member. We've not heard that he has left PDP for APC. So it's, 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 uh, it seems like APC is trying to draw the PDP into its fold so that uh, the PDP might become extinct. So we see Chidoka, one of the PDP chieftains, saying PDP will collapse if not reformed and the kind of game that APC is playing. Do you think this is the beginning to the end of a formidable opposition in Nigeria? 
Yes, it is. And uh, this is one of the dangerous things that our politicians don't take into consideration. You see, having opposition is, is good for a democratic system. One, it provides alternative to the electorate. And secondly, it checks the government, uh, the party in power by providing alternative uh, policy options. And, uh, you know, uh, these are some of the goodies of having um, a, an opposition party, a very credible opposition party or parties. But in Nigeria, we don't seem to learn a lesson. We try to muzzle the opposition, uh, either through brute force or through, uh, you know, uh, corruption and bribery like, like this, uh, trying to woo them by giving them position and so on. That also threaten the, the even survival of democracy because it will end up having dictatorial uh, system whereby instead of responding to the people, will be, everything will be responding to those in power. So I think, yes, there is the uh, need and it is an essential part that we should have credible opposition, whether it is PDP or any other thing, our leaders should learn a lesson. Because that was what caused the Pelua, uh, the collapse of uh, the First Republic, and the collapse of the Second Republic, and it uh, literally uh, disabled the aborted Saudi uh, Republic. Because at the end of it, if you don't allow credible opposition and democratic, you know, discussions and so on, you are now opening a uh, way to violence and uh, crisis. So uh, I think that uh, our leaders should learn a lesson from what happened in Nigeria in the past about the way they handle opposition parties. Okay, let's take a final question now. Um, let's go to what is happening in Niger. Ecowas is standing their ground and saying that there might be military intervention. In fact, uh, they are so vehement about it that it seems as if there will be uh, the, that military intervention. But we go to Niger. Nigerians, uh, first, uh, first of all, we heard a few days ago that there are a lot of, of them who are volunteering to become army to become part of the military so that they can fight the impending war because they are seeing it as a war against the ECOWAS or whoever else is opposing them. They are forming alliances with new world powers like Russia, like China and others. And now the Nigerian government even is calling for war volunteers. So which means these people who are volunteering will now be taken and then there are, there are others that might join them so that they will fight the war. Now, Sahel Alliance is seeking the release of Bazoum. That one is understandable. But my concern is, what would you say about the democracy that we're seeing in Africa? Do we really stand the test of time when we talk about democracy? Is it really uh, a truism? Is, is it really something, a fact, that people say the best form of military government is worse than the worst uh, civilian government. In the wake of all, this, uh, that are, all these things that are happening in Africa, do you still believe in that statement? Do you think what is happening, especially in the West African sub-region, because we've seen Mali, we've seen uh, other countries now forming an alliance even with Niger and all that, and they are giving the same kind of reasons for attacking the civilian government. Let me hear your thoughts about the democracy we have in Nigeria and how that is different in any way uh, from even the military uh, takeover that we are experiencing now. You see, one, uh, the option or the position taken by ECOWAS will not solve that uh, problem because military solution, I mean, military approach will only compound the problem. Uh, we just talked about insecurity in Nigeria and in Sahel. So it will compound that, given the fact that there are already, uh, you know, powers behind. So I think 
that is uh, not an option. Now, the other thing when you talk about uh, uh, the threat of uh, democracy or that democracy is better than a military regime, yes, the why it is better, democracy is better, but the reason why it is better because it is one of the ways or the best way to have a good governance, a responsible and uh, responsive kind of government. So at least the democracy translates into good governance. You cannot uh, rule out the issue of uh, military intervention. Whether you have a constitution, you know, like uh, here in Nigeria, we have constitutional uh, prohibition, which uh, makes it illegal uh, to have any form of government other than democratically elected form of government. And if that is to work, the leaders and the government should provide a good governance, a very a, a, a responsive, a responsible kind of leadership. But if you don't do that, Hey, you know, the, the military, you are inviting the military. You are giving them an excuse to come. And uh, if you say you have the constitutional provision, which is much, which makes it illegal. Once they come, what they do is to set aside the constitution, uh, to set us aside the legislature, and now enact new decrees. And which, by new decrees, they now become a legitimate government because uh, one of the basic things of a uh, law is that a new law supersedes uh, the pre-existing one. So the the military are aware of that. And uh, so, if we are to have uh, to ensure the survival of democracy, I think our leaders should try to translate democracy into good, good governance. In reality, we have to see the improvement of the living condition of uh, the citizenry. We have to see an accountable leadership. We have to be, see a responsive leadership. And we have to see rule of law. Okay, if all these things are trampled by the civilian, they are just inviting the military. Mm. Okay, well, this is where we'll have to draw the curtain, and it's a good way to stop the segment of this show. We'd like to thank you so much, Professor, for coming on the show this morning. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be looking at the second hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>